Okay, um, so my name is Mark McCauley. I work in the chemical engineering department at the University of Chester. Um, the first thing that I'm going to say at the outset is that this work was done in collaboration with, with Enrique, who's sitting here to my left. Um, so I'm going to do the first five minutes of the talk. Um, but really, I'm going, to, I'm going to focus on the biology underlying this system. And then Enrique is going to focus a little bit more on some of the modeling that they, we've done recently. All right, so you might ask yourself the question, um, why I'm showing you a picture of a mouse model at a computational modeling uh, uh, seminar. Uh, well, the answer is pretty straightforward. Although these two mice that we're looking at um, are genetically the same, they're actually epigenetically different. Um, and the reason why for these very striking differences is because during embryonic development, their mother was um, fed different levels of uh, um, P vitamins. Okay, so the mouse on the, the left was deprived, uh, whereas the one on the, the right wasn't. Okay, so it's given give rise to two very different uh, phenotypes. Okay, the reason for this is that um, we have um, um, an effect on, on the gene uh, called the Agouti gene, uh, which um, alters gene expression. Okay, so B vitamins have a big role to play in, in gene expression. Not only um, do B vitamins have a role to play in gene and um, during embryonic development, but they're also um, very important during adult life as well. Okay. So the, the, the methylation patterns, for example, that are established during um, embryonic development, um, if they change uh, during adult life, this can leave us vulnerable uh, to disease. Okay, so where do uh, these methyl groups come from that bind to our DNA and help to regulate um, our genes? Well, they come from uh, the folate pathway. Okay, so if we take a look at my diagram here, I got my laser pointer. Yeah, the other way around. Yeah, the other way around. Yeah. Okay, so we start up here. If you imagine this is our cell. And um, our dietary folates enter the cell. They're metabolized to 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate. It gives its methyl group up. And that methyl group subsequently um, ends up covalently bonded to a cytosine on our DNA. And there's an enzyme um, that, that helps to do this, and it's called DNA methyltransferase 1. Okay, that enzyme works in conjunction with a number of other enzymes that help to maintain methylation status. Okay, so every time a somatic cell in your body divides, these enzymes have to work together um, to maintain methylation levels. In recent years, we actually, with um, experimentalists, have found out that um, there's also enzymes involved in removing the methyl groups as well. So it's a subtle balancing act between methylation and demethylation. Okay, so from an aging perspective, why is this all very important? Well, if we look at someone's genome, an older person's genome, we'll see um, there's a paradox. And that paradox is that uh, overall, globally, the genome is hypomethylated, which means we've lost methyl groups. And then specific regions within the genome, um, they're hypermethylated. Most notably, promote gene promoters um, um, become hypermethylated. This is a problem because the gene is then silenced okay, when they become hypermethylated. And this is a, we see this phenomenon and uh, particularly in cancer. Uh, Carol mentioned that there's a lot of things that go on during aging. Well, one of the things that change is, is the, your metabolism. Um, we also have oxidative stress as a major player. So I have links from the mitochondria coming into both folate metabolism and um, the methylation cycle. So look, these two things impact um, both folate metabolism and the methylation cycle. So in summary, if we're looking at it from a, uh, a systems biology perspective, if we're looking at um, a gene promoter, we can say that um, the overall effects of, um, of, of um, DNA methylation are regulated by intrinsic events, which are the methylation enzymes, and extrinsic events, which are the mitochondria and folate metabolism. Okay, so where do, where do we come into this? Well, where we come into this is that 
as a collective or integ integrative model, these aspects of um, methylation have, haven't been modeled. But what we do have that has been modeled is the folate pathway. And most recently it was modeled by Enrique and I. Um, but we do have other models um, um, that have been done previously, mainly in folate metabolism. We also have two examples of the DNA methylation cycle. One here is deterministic and the other is stochastic. The reason why these guys did it stochastic is that the system, um, the experimental data suggests that it's um, stochastically regulated. Okay, so we, we, are, we are currently adapting our model and um, integrating the folate pathway with a DNA methylation cycle. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to be running some deterministic and stochastic simulations using COPASI. Okay, so Enrique's going to talk now. Oh, sorry, these are some of the people that I've been working with recently. One of them's coming up to speak now. So he's just going to talk about some other aspects of folate metabolism. Thank you. Yes, uh, to be honest, just to share uh, something interesting that I found in, in um, I found in the folate cycle and other and other cycles that is being ignored for some reason. Um, this is a sort of general scheme of the folate cycle. It has been extensively studied by, from the biochemistry perspective, and there are two reactions that. Um, have been described for over 20 years now. The biochemistry of these reactions uh, is relatively well known. And all those two together form what we call a futile cycle. Futile cycles uh, are known uh, in other uh, pathways, like the, the glycolytic pathway, for instance, has at least two we know of. And they are quite important, and they, they really bring uh, an, uh, a more realistic perspective when you model uh, these pathways. And um, to put it very simply, they drive, they drive the fluxes of, of a pathway. And what is crucial here is because one of the two reactions, the two reactions usually involved in a futile, futile pathway, or futile cycle, sorry, uh, are irreversible. And one of them usually is ATP driven. And by sensing the levels of ATP, they drive the fluxes of, of a, the flux of a pathway uh, in a manner that is quicker and cheaper than going through the whole cascade of kinases and phosphatases that other types of, of systems uh, need to use. Um, those two reactions, again, are relatively well is, uh, studied from a chemistry perspective. And only when you include them you understand certain, uh, certain dynamics, such in the, in the folate cycle. It was very interesting to see that the flux is highly dependent on that fetal cycle. If you take away at least one of the two reactions from that cycle, um, the dash line here uh, is the flux without the fetal cycle in this specific uh, system, which is the folate cycle. Uh, the mass also suffers, so the total mass is the red line here. Without the futile reactions, the mass drops significantly. This green line here is a specific type of mass, so it's the mass that sort of covers only the, uh, the central part. So what we found is that the mass that goes here in the blue uh, ellipse doesn't change a lot. It's the mass that serves for anabolic processes. So I'm still trying to figure out how to name those type of masses. But that's how we see here. So total mass changes, but not the mass that sort of serves the core of the pathway. Uh, what does it mean really in this case scenario? Uh, we don't know yet, and we're trying to, to understand. But it's only there when you include futile cycles that this is more obvious. And uh, interestingly, for instance, the, the folate cycle and folate metabolism has been shown to serve for the production of NADPH. And it's only, possibly not even seconds, but it's at the same level of the pentose phosphate pathway, which is the pathway that traditionally uh, is known to produce NADPH. And I don't need, need to remind you what NADPH is, is important for. And folate is metabolism is as important as the pentose phosphate pathway to produce NADPH. Again, 
It's only when you model with a futile cycle that that becomes very apparent. So this has been shown by metabolomics. So experimentally speaking, this has already been shown uh, by the Joshua Rabinovich group in Princeton. And we, in this model, can mimic, replicate, or simulate that quite clearly. This is an ADPH uh, changing by uh, over a thousand uh, fold uh, when the flux drives a rapid mode. So I can finish now. I'm half a minute late. And the sensing of ATP, this is uh, different levels of ATP up to the, 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 the cellular concentrations reported for ATP. And it's only when you have a futile cycle that ATP, that ATP is sensed in, in a more realistic manner. So if you don't have a futile cycle, the sensing of ATP, the flux, to sense ATP, the flux is 20 or 25 times less than otherwise. Thank you.